contract. Yeah, maybe. We are so fortunate to have Dr. Christine Swagger, the star of TV, <laughs> movies, the author of any number of books about any number of things. So without any further ado, Dr. Swagger, or Chris. in Philadelphia, Queen Elizabeth made this statement, we lost the American colonies because we lacked the statesmanship to know the time and manner of yielding what it is impossible to keep. And I wonder what he was talk she was talking about. So tonight I want to talk about what Parliament was doing during this Revolutionary War in the South. Now, there are three main characters to start with. The king, and you all know about King George III. His prime minister, Lord North, who was a fine politician, but he was no wartime leader, and he knew it, tried repeatedly to resign. And the king wouldn't let him, because the king didn't like most of the people in Parliament, didn't want to deal with anybody else. Now, the third member, is Lord Germain. Now, as a younger man, he had been in the army, and he was a lieutenant general. That's three stars. In France, or in Europe, in 1759, he had been in charge of the cavalry in reserve. And when the commander of the battle, uh, Prince Frederick of Brunswick, ordered the reserves to attack the French flank, Germain refused. And as a result, the French were able to retreat and the opportunity for the Allied forces to win that battle was lost. Prince Ferdinand obviously was a little bit upset <laughs> and complained and the British government stripped Germain all of his commission and dismissed him from the military. Now, Germain thought, well, uh, he'd do better with British officers, so he asked for a court martial, and he got it. And they declared him guilty. And they concluded that he was unfit to serve His Majesty in any military capacity, whatever. And now, 20 years later, he's the Secretary of the Colonies, and he is running the war for England. How could such a man have such a position? Well, the king wanted to punish the colonists, and Germain had convinced the king that he was the man to do it. Now, if you know about the Northern Campaign, you know he wasn't doing it very well. And they decided, he decided, that he needed a new strategy, and that strategy was the Southern strategy. And the idea was that they'd bring troops from the North to the South, whip up through the South, and all you loyal civilians would join, and you would hold the peace for the king after the British Army moved forth. And he had a little difficulty getting it uh, through uh, Parliament, but he lied. And uh, he said, uh, basically, uh, uh, we, uh, if we can take the South, we'll have something positive from this war, even if we have to let the North go. And that appealed to most members of uh, Parliament because their businesses were suffering. And as Stokesbury writes, an empire in North America which consisted of Hudson's Bay, Newfoundland, Quebec and Nova Scotia in the north, the Atlantic seaboard from the Chesapeake Cape to Florida, and the British West Indies in the south was not to be despised and would be a reasonable solution to Britain's difficulties. Feeling the birth pangs of the Industrial Revolution, Britain did not really need 
the irreconcilably rebellious northern colonies, and might well be better off without them. If the North were lost, so be it. If the South were salvageable, it should be done so. And so parliaments agreed to fund the Southern campaign. Now, it was understood they were running out of money, they were running out of patience. This would be the last major expenditure that Parliament would invest in this miserable war. Now, you know, it started out very well. They had taken Georgia, then they took Charleston, and Clinton moved to uh, uh, establish posts all through the, the colony from which the British troops could operate, and it would be a rallying point, rallying point for all you loyal subjects to come and join his militia. And uh, then Clinton thought everything was under control, and he went back to New York. And he left Lord Cornwallis with 4,000 <laughs> troops. And some advice. First, win the hearts and minds of the people of South Carolina. In other words, all you people he hoped would be loyal subjects to his royal majesty, King George III. And secondly, as Cornwallis moved up through Virginia to win this war, he should protect his supply lines. And he went back to New York. Now, Lord Cornwallis was a very ambitious individual, didn't like Clinton, didn't pay much attention to Clinton, and Clinton, and Clinton should have known that winning the hearts and minds of people in South Carolina would not be easy because Tarleton had already made a reputation for himself at Monk's Corner and the Waxhaws, and then you had people like Dunlap and Christian Huck and Williams, and they treated the settlers <coughs> And so the whole back country exploded. And George, would you give them an idea of where it exploded? Well, I would think it was pretty close to where we're sitting. <laughs> no, that's, that's not the back country. It, you you want the real back country? Yeah, I want my first map, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the back country. Now, Cornwallis probably lost about 500 men. Was he worried? Not particularly. He was concerned with the Continental Army that was moving down under the command of Horatio Gates. And he met him at Camden. And he won the battle. And decimated the Continental Army, chased them back into North Carolina. So Cornwallis was feeling very, very confident. But what about the second bit of advice? Protect your supply lines. On August the 20th, very close by here, the British troops who were accompanying American prisoners to Charleston were attacked by Francis Marion. And from that point on, the British never controlled their supply lines. And you will see why if you see how widely traveled Francis Marion was. <coughs> now, when the word got back to England, Parliament was excited. Lord Cornwallis had won the Battle of Camden, and he was doing just what they expected him to do. He was rolling through the south, and on the, their verge of winning the war. But Cornwallis, confident, now moved to Charlotte. And what got his attention was the Battle of Kings Mountain, when militia surrounded Ferguson at Kings Mountain, killed Ferguson and many of his men, wounded the rest, took the rest prisoners. Now, Cornwallis moved from Charlotte back to Winsboro. And those of us who know our geography, know that that's a retreat. <laughs> but nobody in Parliament, even if they heard about it, understood that that was a retreat. They were convinced that Cornwallis was going into a winter camp. And that made sense. The British always had a winter camp. And so nobody in Parliament was particularly concerned. 
But Cornwallis would soon meet his match because the Americans now have a new commander in the South. It's Nathaniel Green. And Nathaniel Green sent Daniel Morgan out to the western part of the state to spirit up the troops and annoy the enemy. And when William Washington, on New Year's Day, overran Tories at Hammond's store, and then moved to William's plantation, which was only 15 miles from 96, Lord Cornwallis had to respond. And he would send <coughs> Carl Tarleton out to destroy Morgan. Now, Stokesbury is a great writer. And he writes, for 10 days in early January, Tarleton first looked for and then chased Morgan, whom he outnumbered two to one. On January 17, he made the mistake of catching him. <laughs> <laughs> and we have the Battle of Cowpens. And again, a disaster for the British. And, uh, but Parliament never really was concerned about it because Cornwallis wasn't there. And they were following Lord Cornwallis, their great hero. So Cornwallis starts to pursue the Continental Army across North Carolina. And you got that man. And the Continental Army gets to Virginia. Continentals in blue, with the British in red. And uh, leave Lord Cornwallis in North Carolina beyond his supply line, suffering from the winter, February in North Carolina, can be a little uncomfortable. And uh, Green realizes, though, that he's got to meet uh, the Cornwallis in the field. And so the middle of March, they fight a battle at Guilford Courthouse. <laughs> and Green leaves the field, retreats. Cornwallis keeps the field and wins the battle. Now, when the word of Gilbert Courthouse reaches Parliament, they're ecstatic. Their hero, Lord Cornwallis, is moving right up through the South and winning this war. But Nathaniel Green understood what Parliament did not understand. Lord Cornwallis' army was being bled to death. Now, Green was sort of a micromanager. He paid attention to the little details. Now, Lord Cornwallis had lost about 500 men in those early skirmishes. At the Battle of Camden, which he won, he lost about one in four of his redcoats, and 800 soldiers were too sick to even make it to the battlefield. And then, at Kings Mountain, he lost 100 troops, 100 British soldiers, provincials, and 900 Tory militia. At Blacksburg, he lost another 100 regulars and provincials. And at Calvin's, he lost a fourth of his army, all of his light infantry. Now, he had been reinforced by General Leslie. But in that trip across North Carolina, Cornwallis <coughs> lost 17% of his men to death, disease, and desertion. And now he had won at Guilford Courthouse, but he lost a fourth of his army doing it. And what was even worse, he lost about three dozen British officers, many of them senior, the backbone of the British Army, killed or wounded. And Green knew that eventually England was going to have to stop. England could not continue to take the loss of man, material, and money. And if Congress would stay the course, the Americans would eventually win. But when the war was, halt was halted, or the hostilities ended, Britain would keep all the territory it held. It was international law at the time. It's called Utai Pacitidis. As you hold, if the war had ended in March after Guilford Courthouse, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina would have remained British territory. 
and you people might be singing God Save the Queen <laughs> at your uh, the athletic events. Green understood that he had to take back the territory. And so he does not follow Lord Cornwallis. Green turns his face to the south and to move back into South Carolina. Up until this point, all the battles here are part of Cornwallis's campaign to take the south. From now on, it will be part of Green's campaign to take it back. Lord Cornwallis goes to Wilmington, and in Parliament, they're not the least bit upset because the poor boy with his victorious army needs to rest and be resupplied. <coughs> and they have no idea of what is going on behind Lord Cornwallis's lines. And if you give us the next. <coughs> you know what Green plans to do. He's going to take the big posts hope the militia will take the small post, and he's going to take back as much territory as fast as he can. And he moves toward uh, Camden, and Lighthorse Harry Lee and Francis Marion take Fort Watson, and then they take Fort Mott, and, and Thomas Sumter takes Lawrenceburg. But Green fails to take Camden, and he loses the Battle of Hawkirk Hill. But Lord Rodden evacuates Camden, and all the territory north of the Santee River, with the exception of Georgetown, and you're going to hear about Francis Marion taking that back eventually. And then he moves over to 96. And 96, under siege. And Lord Rodden goes to 96, breaks the siege, and then evacuates 96. And while Green is preoccupied with 96, Lord Cornwallis now starts his campaign up from Wilmington, and he's headed toward Virginia. And Parliament is ecstatic because their hero is once again on the move, and the war is going to be won, they think. Uh, the, uh, the morale is very high in that uh, area. And in the summer of 1781, Lord North's government was again confident and complacent about the war in the colonies. Viewed from London, Lord Cornwallis's year-long march across the, the uh, south after his victory in Charleston <coughs> had been like an English knife through colonial butter. Surely it would now be a matter of only a little time before the colonists would come to their senses and call off the rebellion. Green moves back to the high hills of the Santee, just a little bit north of here. The only American army, in, I'm sorry, British army in the field is just across the Santee River from Clarendon County. And Green is assembling, he hopes, an army that will finally deal with that British, uh, with that British army. Now, Lord Cornwallis and Benedict Arnold and Tarleton are making life difficult for Thomas Jefferson in Virginia. And all of the news from Cornwallis is uplifting, upbeat, everything is going fine. But Green moves against Utah Springs on the 8th of September. And in a bloody battle with 42% casualties for the British, 28% casualties for the Americans, Green leaves the field. And regroups, comes back the next day, and the British are evacuating Utah Springs. And so Green does not attack. He doesn't want more casualties. He wants the territory. And so, when he does follow the, the, uh, the British Army long enough to be sure that they're headed back for Charleston, and he goes back to the high hills to rest his army without knowing that at that point, the French fleet has defeated the British fleet in the Chesapeake Bay, 
and Lord Cornwallis is stranded in a little Virginia town called Yorktown. Five weeks later, Lord Cornwallis surrenders his troops at Yorktown. Now you might think, as some of our students do, that Yorktown ended the war. Not at all. Now it usually took six weeks or more for news to get back to Europe. But a fast French frigate, say that fast, <laughs> <laughs> left Yorktown, went directly to France to break the news that the British had been defeated. And Benjamin Franklin in Paris got the news November 19th. That is just one month after uh, Yorktown. Now, the British didn't get the news until the 26th of November. And <clears throat> Lord Germain, Lord North, and the King consult. Two days later, Parliament reconvenes. They are astounded. I mean, wasn't Cornwallis winning the war? <laughs> well, maybe it's time to quit. <clears throat> However, the King will explain it all. And when the, queen, the king made his address to Parliament, he never mentioned Cornwallis, and he never mentioned Yorktown. It was business as usual. The war will pursue the war with vigor. The colonists will come to their senses, and we will win and punish the colonists. Did he believe it? Yes, he did. Because Germain had convinced him that if they had a very strong commander for that army that Clinton had in New York that he hadn't used in a year, if they went up the field, they could defeat George Washington and still win this war. And Parliament, all of a sudden, was really confused and very upset because they started getting information back from the colonies and from other commanders like Burgoyne and the House and Clinton. Um, and they realized that Germain's their problem and they've got to get rid of him. But he has wartime powers. How do you get rid of him? If he won't resign, and he won't resign. For two <coughs> solid months, Parliament did nothing except try to figure out how to get rid of Lord Germain. And what was happening here? Well, the British troops were attacking plantations to feed their troops in Savannah and Charleston. Bloody Bill Cunningham, David Fanning in North Carolina, uh, Thomas Waters and Burnfoot Brown in Georgia were inflicting heavy casualties on the civilian population. And Parliament did nothing. Well, the whole matter got settled when the king decided he wanted a replacement for Clinton, and he named Sir Guy Carleton. And Sir Guy Carleton was arrogant and ambitious, but he also had impeccable military credentials. Now remember, Germain had been court-martialed, and Carleton held him in utmost contempt. And all through the years, the two of them had been adversaries. And now, with, with Carleton having the ear of the king and the command of the army in America, Germain knew he was finished. So he did resign and took a seat in the House of Lords. When he showed up, there were catcalls, boos, condemnation, but he was not a man of great sensitivity, as you know. <laughs> so he took his seat. <laughs> The king now realizes that he's going to lose the colonies. And he writes a letter of abdication. And because he couldn't face losing part of his empire, Lord North talks him out of it. But Lord North lost his government in February. <coughs> and the new government finally gets the Whigs, the people who had opposed the war all the time they formed a government. And their prime minister was Rockingham. And the king despised him, wouldn't meet with him. And so how do you form a government 
without a, without a, a session with the king. Well, this took some more time, and finally they came to a compromise. The Earl of Shelburne would become the go-between and convey information back and forth between the Prime Minister and the King. Now, once the government was formed, the first order of business was to send Carlton to this country, not to continue the war, but to remove all British troops from the colonies. And also, if he could, to approach the Congress about a peace deal. Well, he was not able to do that. And Prime Minister Rockingham and Shelburne were determined that this war had to end. And they started to plot of how it could be done, and then Rockingham died in a flu epidemic the first day of July. And that left Shelburne. Now, Shelburne is a bright individual who had followed the war in opposition to it and was very well informed on what had happened. He was determined to make peace with the Americans because until that was settled, he couldn't make peace with France and Spain and their navies were threatening the, spice, the sugar islands. He, they had to have uh, a treaty with the Americans. Now, Congress had agreed to let France do their negotiating for them and had given that word to uh, Benjamin Franklin, who was in Paris. And so for a while, uh, very little was done. But Shelburne was determined. He was have a peace treaty. And he also knew that any peace treaty would, it would establish these colonies as independent. And that was a given at this point. And, uh, but he knew Parliament wouldn't hold still for that. And the king and, and the former king's go uh, government, wartime government, they were still sitting in Parliament. They still wanted to punish the, the colonists. He knew that he could not depend on Parliament to do it. Because if Parliament got involved, it would be months, maybe years, before it was settled. So Shelburne dismissed Parliament decided that he would negotiate himself. He sent his representative over to uh, France, and Benjamin Franklin had been determined not to discuss anything, not to meet with the British, uh, because that's what the French wanted. But <clears throat> Providence sort of stepped in, and Franklin had kidney stones. And with his chronic gout, and his kidney stones, he was confined to his bed. And the representative met with John Jay. And John Jay's attitude was, let the French dictate the terms for America, not on your life. <laughs> and so Jay first established, wanted to establish, we are an independent nation. You are not dealing with separate colonies. You are uh, dealing with the United States of America. And Shelburne understood that, not a problem. And then, if you show the next map, <clears throat> England, France, and Spain assumed that if the colonies were independent, that they would have the same form that they already had. And that meant that the western boundary would be the Appalachian Mountains. And Jay said, absolutely not. We will have the territory clear to the Mississippi River and the right to navigate on the Mississippi River, and which now is the shaded area, clear through there. And the British representative explains to him that that won't be acceptable to Spain and France. They had their eye on that territory. And Jay says, if that line is insisted upon, it is needless to talk peace. And the British collapsed 
accepted that. And what I find even more amazing, when he said the Great Lakes will be the upper region, that meant the Shelba was giving away part of Canada. And he did. It took another 80 years to get that treaty straightened out with the Canadian border. But the British backed down. Then John Adams arrived. And he's a New Englander. And he says, we want fishing rights on the Grand Banks. That's clearly the territory that belongs to Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Labrador. And the British pointed that out, and he said, well, the French are fishing there, and we're closer than the French are. And the British backed down. Now, when Franklin comes back, he realizes that he can't trust the French, and he enters into uh, secret negotiations. And by the end of the summer, in the fall, the Americans are prepared with nine conditions. The information is conveyed to Shelburne. And again, Parliament's still in session, not out of session, and, but coming back soon, Shelburne knows that the Americans' attitude is take it or leave it, <laughs> and Parliament will soon be back in session, and he doesn't want them involved, and he has them sign it. And, the 25th of November, 1782, a year after Yorktown, they meet in Paris and they sign. And they sign an alphabetical order, which pleased John Adams. Because it was John Adams, um, Benjamin Franklin, John Jay, and then Henry Lawrence, who had, had joined at the very, very end. Shelburne was a brilliant politician. And he made sure that the British signed it in the name of the king's government. And two days later, Parliament came back in session, and the king addressed them, reading a speech that Shelburne had written for him. And out of consideration of the king's feelings, he only had to mention, say the word independence once. <laughs> um, but the king outlined the conditions. And Parliament went crazy. I mean, haven't we defeated these people? Why aren't we punishing them? What do you mean we're giving them fishing rights and all of that <coughs> territory? The king was on a vitriolic tirade. Lord North uh, renounced the treaty. And even people of uh, uh, Shelburne's own party were upset because they had no intention of letting the colonists uh, secede from the British Empire. They didn't want the war, but they didn't want to lose the colonies either, so they were unhappy. And Paul Parliament then recesses for Christmas. Over Christmas, Shelburne negotiated peace treaties with France and Spain. He didn't make it to Holland, but that was a minor. And so when Parliament came back after Christmas, Shelburne thought, surely he could survive. Because England is now at peace for the first time in eight years. He settled the American situation, France and Spain. Uh, why wouldn't they be happy about all of this? Well, when Parliament came back, they were even more upset than when they left. And to make matters worse, Lord North, who had been head of the Tory government, and Charles James Fox, who was one of the leading opponents of the war, agreed to form a coalition government. The two of those people had been enemies for years. They hated each other. But they were willing to unite to scrap that treaty. The king was a little upset. but. Shelburne was gone, and this coalition government was determined that they could do better. They soon found they couldn't, because Shelburne had been sure that the conditions had been signed, 
in the name of the king's government. So North and Fox wasted another six months, and then uh, finally, in September, the Second Treaty of Paris was signed, ending the war, almost two years after Yorktown. Now Benjamin Franklin wrote to a friend, we are all friends with England and all mankind. <clears throat> May we never see another war. For in my opinion, there never was a good war or a bad peace. <clears throat> now why was Parliament so furious with Shelburne? He had really committed political suicide. Well, part of it was partisan politics. Those two sides were never going to agree on anything anyway. But it was even more than that. It was a lack of information. Remember, it took six weeks, eight weeks to get any written word back across by sailing ship. And the information was pretty sparse. And they also had been fed a lot of propaganda. Remember, most people in Parliament still thought that Lord Cornwallis had swept through the South in a series of victories. Well, the poor boy lost his army at Yorktown, but hadn't he taken the South? Hadn't he conquered all of that territory? And why were we giving it up? We know that while Cornwallis was moving north, Green was moving south. And so Yorktown might have been a wake-up call but it was the strategic win at Utah Springs that allowed the Americans to negotiate from a position of strength. And because uh, Shelburne understood what had happened, he realized that he was making the best deal he could possibly make. Now, the poet wrote at Utah Springs, the bandit died, their bones with dust are covered o'er. Weep on these springs your tearful tide, how many heroes are no more. If in this wreck of ruin they can yet be thought to claim a tear, O oh, smite thy gentle breast and say, the friends of freedom slumber here. I would suggest to you tonight that the poet might have finished that line, the founders of our freedom slumber here at Utah Springs. That concludes our program for this evening. Certainly appreciate everybody coming, sharing with us, and one Christine Gray. Yeah. <laughs>
1780, and then they moved north, and they took Georgetown uh, in July of 1780. It stayed in their hands until it was liberated by Francis Marion in May of 1781. That's what I have to say about Georgetown. The second part of this is about Francis Marion. And for those of you who don't know, Francis Marion was a general during the American Revolution from South Carolina. At the time South Carolina was invaded, he was a lieutenant colonel in the Continental Army. He was not in Charlestown because he broke his ankle and was sent out of the city before the city fell. He organized the resistance uh, after the city fell, and for time being, he was the only American force operating in South Carolina. When General Green entered the state uh, with a new American army, uh, he cooperated with Green, and by the end of the war, the entire eastern section of South Carolina was basically under Marion's control, and he helped restore civilian rule in a very meaningful way. Uh, Marion has always been Georgetown's favorite son, and uh, between November of 1780 and uh, May of 1781, Marion made three attempts to retake the city, the last attempt being the only one that was successful. So the question becomes why? Uh, I read one book said that he wanted to, to liberate Georgetown because it was his boyhood town. I read another book that said that he wanted to get a nice new uniform because his uniform was kind of ratty looking after being in the woods for so long. I don't think so. Uh, Marion was a much more substantial person than that. I have, uh, over the years, done a lot of research, and it's always fun to go to the places. Uh, went to Georgetown and looked around for evidence of Francis Marion didn't find much, nice memorial to the fact he liberated the town. Went to the Information Bureau and asked them if they knew where Francis Marion lived when he lived in Georgetown or where his brother lived. And they were pointed out to be a place called Belle Isle, which is a golf course out in the islands. And they said, that's where he was born. There's a fireplace there left. A very pretty place, nice fireplace, nice ruins, but has absolutely nothing to do with Francis Marion. Uh, the Belle Isle, in Georgetown was owned by the Ori family. Peter Ori lived there for a while and he inherited it from, I think, his uncle. And as far as I know, the Marians never had any connection with it unless they visited there as a guest. So that was not correct. Francis Marion was born at a plantation called Goat's Field on the west branch of the Cooper River uh, in amongst the, the French settlements there. His parents uh, moved from there to Georgetown around 1738, 39, and all the books say that he, his parents went there to send him to school. But the problem is there was no school in Georgetown in 1739. There was not a school in Georgetown until 1755, at which time uh, Marion was about 21, 22 years old and well beyond going to school. So why did they move to Georgetown? Well, Lee gives us a hint in his memoirs when he says that the, the general's father became a little embarrassed in his affairs. And if you look, you will see that in fact, around 1739, uh, the elder Marion does become a little embarrassed in his affairs. He drops off the tax rolls. We start seeing family memorials indicating that uh, the general's wife is in uh, necessary situation with finances and her, her extended family is trying to help her financially. So we have a problem uh, that the general's father is having a tough time financially. By moving to Georgetown, he does two things. He immerses his younger two sons, Francis and Joe, in an English culture, in the English language, because they had been living in a French community. And also, the Marians are very heavily intermarrying with the Alston family, which is a very wealthy family in Georgetown. Uh, John Alston Jr., the son of a very prominent rice grower, uh, marries the general's oldest sister, uh, Esther. Uh, the general's brother, Benjamin, marries Martha Alston. Uh, the general has a first cousin, Esther Simmons, who marries Josiah Alston, 
and Isaac, the brothers of General Marion, marries Rebecca Alston, who was a cousin of, of, of the other Alstons. So we have this tremendous intermarriage of the Marion family and the first families of Georgetown. And it's possible that collectively they had a tutor and that the general would have learned from a tutor. So in about 1750, the general's father dies and John Alston, who is the husband of the general's oldest sister, uh, Esther, leaves a will in which he says that Esther Marion, the general's mother, is entitled to live for her life in John Alston's townhouse in Georgetown, and that Esther Marion, John Alston's wife, the general's sister, it's tough, these names keep repeating each other. You know, I'm sorry if it gets kind of confusing. Everybody should name their kids different names, but they don't. Anyway, the sister is entitled to live there during her widowhood. Now, you have to understand at this time period that women did not have the right to own property if they were married. Once you married, your husband owned everything you had, right down to the shoes on your feet. He could do with it whatever he wanted. So frequently, male family members would leave things to women in trust or the right to use during their life or the right to use during their widowhood because they didn't want the property to pass out of the family to the new husband where it could be dissipated. So Esther Marion was the mother, had the right to live there her life, and the Esther Marion, the general sister, could live there during her widowhood. Now, about the same time, 1758, uh, 1752, Gabriel Marin, the general's brother, also buys a townhouse in uh, Georgetown, and they're all living there. Uh, and they live there until about 1755, when the general, his mother, and Gabriel move up the river. Um, let me go back here. Whoops. They move. Uh, up, up the Santee River, and they have a plantation up there. Okay. The brother Isaac Marin and Gabriel Marin and Benjamin Marin all become justices of the peace, so they're important people in the community. Isaac establishes himself at Little River, which is north of Georgetown. This is Little River, very pretty, right on the border of North and South Carolina, and if you ever on Route 17, stop and go into Little River and you'll see this. But what you'll also find out is uh, Isaac had a tavern there. Well, there's still a tavern there, and if you go there and you look and you say, this is a dive, <laughs> I'm sorry. You gotta look at this and you gotta figure Isaac was a smuggler because it's a perfect place for a smuggler. And indeed, uh, Isaac Marion was apparently a member of the Committee of Correspondence and when they sent the first notice of the Battle of Concord, Lexington, they went to Isaac, not to Georgetown where there were royal authorities, not to Charlestown where there were royal authorities, but to Little River where they could come and go uh, without the authorities seeing them. It's a very beautiful spot, but it's immediately apparent when you go there that it was a great spot for smugglers. Um, Isaac was very well thought of in his community. This is what they call a horse. All right. Isaac had a tough time during the American Revolution. The British, after they took Georgetown, took Little River. They, by December of 1780, they had Little River, and Isaac was back in Georgetown. And there's a story in Georgetown that the British, uh, in an attempt to find General Marion, made Isaac Marion ride the horse backwards. It was a sorrel horse, like the general rode a red horse, and people have assumed that that is a flesh and blood animal. But in fact, the British Army had a punishment they called riding the horse. And they'd make the person sit on this rather uncomfortable contraption, uh, and it was a punishment. And in Isaac's case, it was a means basically of torture to try to get him to disclose where his brother was. And Isaac would say, I don't know where he is, but you'll hear from him shortly. And in fact, the British did. Can, can we get dark down a little bit? When Georgetown was founded, the, you know, I can apologize, this looked a lot darker on my computer. 
they, this is the plot plan for the town as it was laid out. Uh, if you look at Georgetown today, this is the map that they give you as a tourist to show you around. You can see there's really not much changed. And this is a, a map that uh, George helped me make up. The, um, although the uh, Bureau in Georgetown couldn't tell me where anybody lived, I was able to figure it out. Gabriel Marion owned this lot here, which is lot 82. This is the lot he bought. He eventually sold it to his brother, Job. Over here, next to him, was owned by Job's wife, who was owned by the Gilliards. They became Tories, but at this point in time, they were friends. The lot over here was uh, the senior John Alston's lot. He gave half of it to his son, Josiah, whose wife, as I said before, was, was Esther Simmons, whose sister was Mary Esther Vidot. So Mary Esther Vidot had half of this that she would have visited with her parents. And the other half went to the general's mother, uh, Esther Marion. So chances are General Marion lived right in this block here when he was in, in Georgetown. The, the other interesting spot is up here. This is where Isaac Marion had a right to live because Rebecca Alston, his wife, had the right to live in her father's townhouse and this was the house they occupied. William Austin, her father, lived next door, was right here. All right, all of which is interesting. But then the other interesting thing is, during the occupation, this was the British headquarters. This was the commandant's house. This was the barracks that they had the British soldiers in. And this was the hospital. So that building there still exists. And it wasn't until I walked the streets of Georgetown that I realized poor Isaac Marion was living between the hospital where the British were bringing back their wounded and the barracks where the British were being housed. So there's no wonder when the British came back from trying to chase Francis Marion and not catching him as they're coming back to town, they break into Isaac's house and totally trash it. So Isaac, they say in real estate, location, location, location. Well, Isaac had a horrible location, location, and uh, he, he suffered for it. So, why three times did General Marion try to, to take Georgetown? We look a little bit closer at Georgetown. Georgetown sits down here at the bottom of this tremendous river system going all the way up into North Carolina. And down that river system came turpentine, came pitch, came tar, all needed for the Royal Navy, came lumber needed by the Royal Navy. Uh, in this area, we have rice that was needed for food for the Army and the Navy. We have a, a draining of the uh, basin where the people from Williamsburg could bring their, their beef down, salted for provisions. Uh, a lot of strategic material coming down here. There were salt boilers. In Georgetown, salt was very necessary. In a hot climate, you need the salt to replace the electrolytes that you perspire out in hot weather. In this time period, you needed salt to preserve meat. So salt was a critical element. All of this was in Georgetown. So if Marion could seize Georgetown, he could deprive the British of all those things. And he would have them for the use of the American army. Furthermore, up in uh, this area, there was a big a big concentration of Tories, and by controlling Georgetown, he could control the supplies going to those Tories, because the only other way they could get supplies would be out of Bloomington. If you look at the map um, as it was at that time, you had Savannah, you had Charlestown, you had Georgetown, you had Wilmington, but the next real port wasn't until you got to Norfolk, Virginia. So. Georgetown was much more important as a port of entry back then than it is now. The other way of getting supplies up and down uh, the coast was what they call a great wagon road that ran all the way up to Philadelphia, but it goes through Camden. And if you're General Cornwallis and you want to invade North Carolina, 
you're going up this wagon road. That's where they were fighting. And he gets supplies one of two ways. He can get them from Charlestown or he can get them from Georgetown. And as you notice, Georgetown's shorter. To get them from Charlestown, he would flood them up the Cooper River to the area of Monk's Corner. They would then have to unload the supplies, put them on wagons, take them across Monk's Corner, up to Nelson's Ferry, put them on the, on the old Cherokee Path, and run them up the Old River Road on the north side of the river, because the road on the south side of the river wasn't worth calling a road. It was only a footpath. They couldn't get a wagon up there conveniently. That's why that whole area became very strategic. If you look at South Carolina map, I've highlighted the rivers. This is the Santee River. Uh, the uh, other rivers coming out of Georgetown. Uh, I've got ahead of my notes. It's always a danger. You have the Sand Pit, the Black, the Mingo, the Wacomar, if I pronounced that right, the Great PD and the Little PD. Uh, in order to get into this area of South Carolina, there's only four or five fords. There's a, a Lynch's Causeway, there's Murray's Ferry, there's Lanute's Ferry, I've done that in the wrong order, there's Nelson's Ferry and McCourt's Ferry. And these are choke points. If you can't get across those areas, you can't get from this part of South Carolina to that part of South Carolina. And Marion is sitting in this area, he's controlling this. And the only other way of getting up in this area is to come behind through Georgetown. And if he controls Georgetown, he controls this whole area by also controlling those ferries. So it makes it strategic. Green never really appreciated that. From Green's point of view, Georgetown was a minor interest, but Marion saw it as a very important interest. Today we talk in military terms about logistics. They say that amateurs in the military talk about, you know, military buffs talk about strategy. Professional soldiers talk about logistics. Marion was trained by the British as a provincial officer in the Indian Wars. He was one of those core Americans that really had some professional training, he thought in terms of logistics. If you control the supplies, you control the territory. Today we would talk in terms of a railhead or in terms of an airport. Georgetown was the equivalent of a World War II railhead. It was the equivalent today of an airport. And for Marion, it was something he wanted very, very much. He could uh, disrupt the Tories by holding it. He could get supplies in from from out of the country by holding it, and uh, he saw it as very important. So the first time he attacked it, um, it was in the November of 1780. Uh, it was not a very determined attack on his part. Uh, he sent probing forces out. This is just another map showing the roads. It's in the back, it's a little bit clearer. Um, this is a map showing that great road again, and if you look closely, this is a map showing the, the movements of, of the armies, which is really this movement here down that road. This is where they were fighting. Uh, the first time Marion uh, attacked Georgetown, he did so uh, with a number of probing incidences where he sent his, his men out on patrols and they cut off the town, they tried to raid it. Uh, ended in disaster personally for Marion because uh, his nephew was captured and murdered. Uh, during that raid. Uh, William Dobbin James, who was uh, one of Marion's men and a biographer, records the incident. Uh, James was terribly impressed because they killed the schoolmaster at the same time. For a young man, 16 years old, the fact they killed the schoolmaster was something he couldn't understand. Uh, but when they captured the younger Marion, Gabriel, and the schoolmaster, they beat them savagely with rifles. And then when the younger Marion was recognized as being a Marion, they put a gun up to his, his chest and just uh, killed him. And uh, the other thing that James recounts, and he's the only first person who does that, uh, Marion cried. And that a man that was known for being uh, very unemotional about everything, the fact that he cried was something that, and he wasn't ashamed to do so. He was a man in a man's world, and, and, and it, he, didn't, he showed his emotion at that time. But after a bit, he got over it, and he said that his nephew was a virtuous young man. He died in the cause of liberty, and he would grieve no more. 
and so they went on. Shortly after that, Harry Lee arrives in Marion's camp, this is in, the, in January, and they plan to attack Georgetown. Uh, it's a complicated plan. Marion has determined that Georgetown really is not defended very well from the sea, and he sends his infantry down the river uh, network. They hide out in the marsh near Georgetown. The plan is they're going to come in at night, and they're going to um, attack the town at night from two sides. The cavalry will come overland. They'll come down the, uh, the highway. Uh, the two groups will meet at night, and uh, they will take the town. So the first group goes down the river. They spend the day hiding out in the marsh. Uh, it's nighttime, it's around midnight. Everything's quiet. The crickets are doing their crickety things. Um, I don't know whether the moon was out, but everything's quiet. People are asleep. The British officers had been partying right here at the hotel at the, the inn. Uh, they had a good time that night, and they were all sleeping in the inn. And everything was quiet in town, and Bree and his men are creeping up from from the water end of the town. They creep up and they get the British headquarters, which is here, and they're creeping up into town. And what they're supposed to do is to get between the British barracks, which is here, and what I believe is the fort, which is up here, I believe, and prevent the British soldiers from running into the fort. But the cavalry hasn't arrived yet, and they're afraid if they wait any longer, they'll be discovered. So they're creeping through the town, and they come up and they catch the British commander in bed, wake him up and say, you're our prisoner. That all works out well. And, and not for the British commander, but you know, for our guys. And they, they've been informed that the rest of the officers are here at the, at the, uh, at the, uh, at this building here that is the, the, the inn and they burst into the inn and this fighting begins and the, the British soldiers, the, the officers that are asleep in the inn hear the commotion, they come running out on the porches, they don't bother to get dressed, there's this fight on the porch. And let me read what Peter Ory says about it because I think it can't be put in any better words. He writes, the infantry and cavalry employed on the occasion were to approach the town at different points. After midnight, and at a signal from the latter to commence the attack. Unfortunately, the cavalry did not get up in town and owing to some fault of their guide. The infantry arrived at the appointed moment and dreading the dangers of delay, charged at once into the town, which they found totally unprepared for the attack. Colonel Campbell, the commander, was made prisoner in his bed. Adjutant Crookshanks, Major Irwin, and the other officers were sound asleep at a tavern belonging to a genteel family with whom they had spent the evening with great hilarity. A detachment of our men approached the house and surrounded it. Soon the alarm was given, the officers leaped out of bed and not waiting to dress, flew into the piazza, flourishing their pistols and shouting to the charge. Major Irwin, with more courage than discretion, fired a pistol and would have tried another but just as he had it caught, he was stopped short by the stroke of a bayonet, which ended him and his courage together. <laughs> Adjutant Crookshanks, acting in the same heroic style, would have shared the same fate, had it not been for an angel of a young woman, daughter of the gentleman of the house. This charming girl was engaged to be married to Crookshanks. Waked by the firing and horrible din of battle on the piazza, she was at first almost reft of her senses by the fright. But the moment she heard her lover's voice, all her terrors vanished, and instead of hiding herself under the bedclothes, she rushed into the piazza amidst the mortal foray, and with no armor but her love, and no covering but her flowing tresses. Happily for her lover, she got to him just in time to throw her arms around his neck and scream out, Oh, save, save, Major Crookshanks. <laughs> Thus with her own sweet body shielding him against the uplifted swords of her enraged countrymen. Crookshanks yielded himself our prisoner, but we paroled him immediately, 
on the spot and left him to those delicious sentiments which he must have felt in the arms of an elegant young woman who had saved his life. <laughs> the eyes of all, even the poorest soldiers in our camp, sparkled with pleasure whenever they talked, as often they did, of this charming woman and of our generosity to Major Crookshanks. And to this day, even after the lapse of 30 years, I never think of it but with pleasure, a pleasure as exquisite, perhaps, as what I felt at the moment of the first transaction. <laughs> so here we have this, um, in the middle of the battle, this apparition of a beautiful woman just covered with her dresses, <laughs> not her dresses, her hair, uh, appearing, and the soldiers stopping mid-battle to enjoy the, uh, the affair. In any event, uh, instead of the soldiers rushing to the to the uh, the enlisted soldiers, because they captured almost all the officers, instead of the enlisted soldiers rushing forward to the fort, they barricaded themselves in their barracks. And this is what they were using for the barracks. It was the church, St. George, which is a brick structure. Uh, the NCOs were apparently smarter than the officers. They barricaded themselves in there. And Marion decided that to, without a cannon, it would be too costly to try to take the church by force. And so he and Lee withdrew uh, with their prisoners. It scared the bejeebers out of the British, needless to say. Um, the third time Marion approached Georgetown was after he'd taken Fort Watt and Fort Watson. And he showed up in front of the city and he started doing what they call regular trenching. He, he started digging trenches to approach the, the town to take it by siege. Now, he had just come back being successful against Fort Mott and Fort Watson. In fact, what Marion wanted, for the most part, Marion got. And uh, they weren't going to risk that. And in the middle of the night, the British evacuated the town. They had earlier orders saying, we can't defend you out there in Georgetown. So if there's any serious uh, demonstrations against you, you have the authority to, to leave the town, which they did. Marion occupied the town, and two days later, his brother Isaac, who was his last surviving brother, uh, passed away and was buried in this area of the churchyard at St. George. Um, I have to imagine that Isaac probably had not been well for some time, and I would also have to imagine there was a certain amount of fear on the part of the British of not wanting to get captured by Marion, knowing that his brother had been abused by them and his brother was dying. Um, once Georgetown was taken, the British uh, were in a bad situation. Green had tried to force a retreat, to force the British out of Camden, was not able to do so, tried to force the British out of 96, was not able to do so. But again, Logistics is the key to these things. Once Fort Watson and uh, Fort Mont were taken up, it's Fort Watson, Fort, is it Fort Mont up there, I think? Uh, Camden couldn't get supplied. They had to withdraw. Once Orangeburg was taken and Fort Gamby, which I think is in this area, again, no, Fort Granby. You know, you come to a point in life you can't see at any distance, it's very annoying. Uh, in the event, when those two forts were taken, they could not support 96 anymore. They could not supply it. And the British withdrew. And withdrew back uh, to Charlestown, as we heard last night from Chris Swager. Uh, the last push of them out of the interior was with the battle at um, Utah Springs, which sealed their fate. Almost as soon as Marion took Georgetown, supplies started to flow. And Georgetown eventually became this huge depot of supplies for the American army. Privateers on the American side started using Georgetown as a base to raid British commerce. Commerce was opened with the Indian Islands, the Caribbean Islands, the West Indies, and goods and supplies started to come from there. Marion was, in essence, levying attacks on, on, on the Tories and on the, the Whigs of the area by asking for a proportion of, of their, uh, their produce, it was being traded. Uh, he, he also, I believe, was involved in a black market trade with Charleston itself uh, to get military supplies for the troops. Uh, 
we see him instituting price controls in Georgetown and basically regulating with Peter Ori in charge uh, a total economic life of Georgetown. Because Marion did not believe Georgetown could be held uh, from a, a determined attack, he moved those supplies up to Willtown on the Black River and they established a huge depot at Willtown for supplies. And when Green, now realizing the importance of Georgetown, became obsessed with, you've got to protect Georgetown, he sent engineers there to fortify it. He would write to Marion periodically, the British are going to attack Georgetown. And Marion's response was, we'll pull everything up to Willtown, which we can defend, that you cannot defend Georgetown from the type of attack, basically, that he had waged against it. Um, after Marion had captured Georgetown, after he was basically pacified much of this area, he was able to force a treaty on the Tories that had been supplied through Georgetown up in the what's today the area of the town of Marion. Um, to much to Thomas Sumter's shame, I believe, he Sumter authorized a raid into the Georgetown area. Uh, while it was controlled by Marion for the sole purpose of looting. Uh, Marion complained very bitterly to uh, the governor at the time, and there was an order to stop uh, confiscating Tory property, uh, slaves and such, uh, because of that. Uh, it caused some problems. Georgetown was, was shelled once by a British uh, warship, and much of the town burned. But the constant flow of supplies into the American uh, interior for the American army continued and Georgetown remained a key community until Charlestown was evacuated and the American army then controlled the entire area. So I think that pretty much concludes my talk. If you have any questions, we would be happy to answer them.